I'm Mike Vardy, and I'm about to have a productive conversation with Angela Crocker. Welcome to an episode from the vault of a productive conversation. This is Mike Vardy revisiting a conversation from six years ago. Can you believe it's been six years since I spoke to Angela Crocker about her book, Declutter Your Data? Actually, it is a book that I think is worth revisiting at this point in time, specifically because of the fact that this is the time of year, if you're listening to this in December of 2023, where you know, you are thinking about getting your data organized, cleaning things up, optimizing. I think this is a perfect episode to revisit. Now, Angela is an acclaimed author, good friend of mine. She's written several books and we get into the specifics of the idea of digital organization, um, taking a look at the apps that you have, looking at your mobile devices, whether they're iPhones, what have you, and organizing them, calendar management, a whole slew of things that I think are really appropriate at this time of year. So without further ado, let's revisit this conversation with Angela Crocker here on A Productive Conversation. Enjoy. I'd like to welcome Angela Crocker to the Productivity Podcast. Thanks for joining me, Angela. My pleasure. Good to see you, Mike. So one of the things I want to talk about is we get into the start of the year, the, the actual calendar year for a lot of people. And we're going to talk about calendars because, you know, I, you and I have some thoughts on calendar and, and decluttering, but I also have the idea that, you know, you don't start your year starting the beginning of January. But for those that do, this is an ideal time for people to start to actually use uh, the opportunity to declutter their data. You've got this book coming out called Declutter Your Data. Take Charge of Your Data and Organize Your Digital Life. So this book has been needed for a long time. What was the impetus based on your last book, The Content Planner? Like, What was the impetus to go from that to this? Well, part of the, what I've realized, Mike, is that my work is really about helping people figure out how to live an efficient digital life. And sometimes that means how to use technology and digital solutions. And sometimes it's about moving things into analog solutions and simplifying what we do. So Declutter Your Data actually started out as an idea I had uh, about three years ago. I was supporting my mom in hospice and didn't have access to the internet most of the day. And so I had to be super efficient about how I used email, how I used social media, what I did. And from that came this sort of calm, this sort of organized self that you know, I'm super organized. I'm known for being organized, uh, but even more so. It was like becoming uber organized. And I had this opportunity to really reflect on it in those months that I was there. And shortly afterwards, I created a blog series called The Digital Cleanse, uh, which was about the time that the content planner was about to come out. And I got talking with my publisher and they said, oh, this is great. We want to publish this book as well. So to have two books in two years is pretty unusual, as you know, as a writer. Uh, yeah. But here we are, and I have to say, you know, the content planner readers have been phenomenal. They have completely embraced the process of content planning. To clutter your data, I think it's going to be a thousandfold more. Uh, everybody has too much clutter in their computer, in their smartphone, in their tablet. And I guess that's what we're going to talk about today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So one of the things that, that, that I've always kind of seen coming, and you have too, is the idea that people are so worried about personal physical organization that they don't think about the stuff that's invisible. And data is really, really invisible. I, I want to talk about the apps first and foremost, because recently, like about a week before we started recording this, uh, there was a, a glitch in iOS where the iPhone uh, on December 2nd, if you had notifications on certain local apps, and this is where I get a bit nerdy, everybody, uh, that you couldn't, um, it would reboot the phone. Like it would re reboot the springboard of the phone so it would look like your phone was rebooting. It wasn't. But it was, I mean, every time a notification came up, your phone would get locked on you. And I followed the steps that luckily the people that know more about this told me what to do. I did. But I looked at this as an opportunity to review the apps that I had on my phone and say, okay, like I didn't have many notifications on in the first place, which could be, a, which is a blessing if you don't want to be interrupted, but is a curse if you want things to hide. And there were a lot of apps that were just kind of hiding. So I took that as an opportunity to get rid of some of these apps. Uh, what, 
what is some, I mean, you're going to talk about this in the book, of course, but what are some of the things that you did or that you suggest people do when they're looking at their apps and they're saying, hmm, I've got all these apps, but they're kind of, they, they either don't see them or they're, they're not doing any harm, right? They kind of are though, right? They are. They are creating distractions and clutter and so much every time we pick up our smartphones. And I developed something I call the app diet. And you need to reduce your app a tight, if you'll allow me to play with words a little bit. <laughs> Our appetite is crazy. It's so easy to download another app, to listen to an expert, and they recommend something. And what I come up with is the notion of reviewing what apps you have and looking for those that you never use. If you don't recognize the icon, it's time to delete that app. Just let it go. You can always download it from the App Store again or Google Play or wherever you get your apps from. Uh, but just let them go and see how it is living without them for a while. You'd be amazed how few of them you miss. The next thing I recommend is to actually look at the apps that you do know and see if there's any that are doing the same thing for you. Mm. Or have you got three word processing apps? Have you got seven apps for editing your photos? Have you got too many apps for scheduling and calendars? How are you communicating with your team? How are you communicating with your family? And very often, people have got multiple solutions. I was guilty of this. The genesis of this came from those photo editing apps I mentioned. And I'm not very good at photo editing. I take better pictures, and mostly I just want to use the original picture. And why did I have seven apps to edit my photos? I don't add sparkles. I'm not big on filters or those sorts of things. And so if you go through category by category, there's endless ways that you can delete the apps that you don't need and really streamline the ones that you do. The other thing you can do is also group apps. So on my smartphone, mostly I just have one screen. Everything's there at a glance. I take advantage of I, the iOS folder situation. So I have a folder called Amuse for the things that I do when I'm playing with my phone. I have another called Social for the social media things. I have another called Documents, which is where my Google Drive and all the writing work that I do. Not that I do much on my phone, but we'll probably talk a little bit about that kind of efficiency later in this mm. conversation. So one of the things that I've done, and, and there's definitely some modifications I've taken into account just from thinking about this stuff. So I have folders based on the themes for my theme days, which we're also going to talk about. So I can say, okay, well, this is the day I go to this folder. You could also do that by page. You could have endless pages of iPhone apps too. But another thing that, that I've tried, and you know, again, you have to have a way to review this, is Joshua Becker talks about in his book, The More of Less, about this idea of, of almost like a staging area. So when you're, when you're decluttering physical objects, instead of um, getting rid of things completely, you put them in, a, in an area like a, like a storage area or something like that. So you would take all these apps, let's say, and put them in a folder that's called like, you know, not using or staging or hold or whatever. And then you have to have a trigger that like later, so maybe in your to-do list app or a calendar or notification or something that says, look at those apps. And it's kind of like the old life hacker uh, article that I, I love, which is the hanger close with the open end of the hanger facing out. And then every time you take that article of clothing off, you turn the hanger around because your brain always will say, oh, I use, I wear that article of clothing all the time, all the time. And then all of a sudden the season passes and you're like, oh, I didn't wear that article of clothing. So your brain will play those tricks on you. And I, and I love the, the, again, the thing about data is, again, it's so invisible that, that it's not staring you in the face like that article of clothing or like that box. It's, you know, it's, it's not there. Um, I want to talk, let's talk about the calendar. Let's talk about that because the calendar you can see up here, we're, we're both in my office right now. And my now your calendar is there. It looks a bit cluttered, but I know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> as long but, as you know. Exactly. But the thing is, is that, um, and, and redundancy is something we'll get into as well. But I look at this calendar and if I'm looking at my computer and I see certain things, I like someone says, hey, can you do this? I can look at that calendar and go, okay, there's a physical calendar that tells me what my obligations are every month. So if someone says, hey, can you go uh, to speak at this conference in February, I'm looking at it going, no, February is already too full. I could see it very visibly. How do you have people, like when it comes to the calendar stuff, I mean, I'm, we, we have uh, in the book and we actually have a, a link uh, that's through the book that kind of, we talk about calendars a little bit. You, you mentioned me in there, which I, I really appreciate. Um, how do you treat calendars when it comes to decluttering and data? Because I've seen that to do show up there, goals show up there, things that that are that are ever movable show up there as opposed to things that should be hard and fast. Let's talk about that a little bit. 
Absolutely. Well, you've hit one of three main problems right there, that people are putting too much in their calendar that they don't need to. Something should be on an action list. Some things should be in a notebook. Uh, figuring out what needs to go in your calendar is sometimes a matter of, of of putting in specific appointments or actions that are time specific. Like you and I are meeting here today, we both had this on our calendar so that Mike and Angela would be face to face. But what happens is people get too much in their calendar, and then you don't see what's there, and it it really overwhelms people. And if they don't know what's there, then they're not going to look at their calendar. Mm -hmm. This then leads to the second problem, where people have multiple calendars, often on different platforms. It's not unusual with people I've chatted with to have a Google calendar, an Outlook calendar, uh, a wall wall calendar. (laughs) And so a big part of my advice is to consolidate and put everything in one calendar. Now, I'm very partial to Google Calendar. It's it's the one I use. It's the one I live in. And part of the reason for that is that I can have layers of calendars that are color-coded, and I can toggle them on and off. There's one for my professional work that is appointments and those sorts of things. I also have appointments with myself around my writing. And I sit down, and each week there are a number of hours that I write. And if I need to talk, move those around, I can, but they're still very important appointments with myself. I also have a calendar for my son. Uh, he's 11 years old. And where Sean needs to be and my husband and I negotiating that, my husband has access to that calendar. And guess what? I've got my husband on Google Calendar, too. So all everyone can relate to all of these overlapping things. And I've just mentioned four. Mm-hmm. I actually have nine calendars that overlap for various parts of my life. And I think by having them all in one place, people would reduce so much stress. A big part of Declutter Your Data is about reducing the amount of digital stress in your life. You don't need to open four apps to figure out what where the information is. Mm-hmm. One, just consolidate into one. So it's funny. We, I want to now we're going to get into redundancy because an intention because I think that that's a lot has a lot to do with it and crap rationalization because there's a lot of crap rationalization <laughs> that goes on too when it comes to this stuff. So. Here's an example. I've got this wall calendar, the Now Year calendar, which I love because it gives me a bird's eye view of very specific obligations. You're not seeing on here things that are that are that are related to like family stuff per se, other than like no school and things. Like there's very deliberate uses of this calendar, which I think is really important because on my digital calendar there are some there is some some high crossover. Like my monthly themes are on my digital calendar as well. Same thing with my daily themes and all that stuff. But this gives me the quick view so that I could see it the whole year at once. So that's a very, very intentional thing. Um, there's no, there, a lot of people, when they have multiple tools doing multiple things, they crap rationalize why they need these things. And a great example <laughs> happened with my own team for a while is, uh, is my podcast producer, John Polster, who's producing this episode. So he's going to get to hear this. Thanks, John. <laughs> loves Trello, loves Trello, works in Trello with his own business. And I get that. We use Asana. And for the longest time, Asana only did things by list. You didn't have a board view, which is what Trello has. So you could move things from one column to the next. Uh, Several months ago, Asana added a board view. And so me being the, the leader of the team said, we're going to now, there's no reason for us to be in Trello anymore because the only thing I'm managing in Trello is this podcast. And it took me a while, but we migrated everything over. We had to make it so. So there, there could be some rationalization to keep things in Trello because John uses Trello and that's what. But when it came to my team, it was hard enough to get people to use Asana in the first place. <laughs> so I had to get them there. So to, I think that there's some elements of when you declutter that the intention has to be like you have to be able to be ruthlessly honest about your intentions behind it. And I think a lot of people, at least in my experience, say, well, but I might need that at this time. Or, you know what, but we use this for this. Whereas, you know, you could say, you could argue that you don't need to use that. It's just the pain of removing it and and trying some, using this other tool that could do it just as well, maybe even better, um, yeah. is something that people are averse to. Uh, can, can you touch on that a little bit? Absolutely. Well, the way I look at it is I talk about it as being dedicated. Mm. Uh, there's a chapter in the book where I talk about dedicated devices, and it applies to apps just as well. And what I talk about, it's, it's easier with devices. So let's talk about that just for a second. You have a computer, 
a mobile phone and a tablet, just for example. That's fairly typical these days. People have three devices. And you have to decide how you're going to use each of those devices. Is it efficient to write a book on an iPhone? Absolutely not. Is it uh, comfortable to lie in bed watching television with a laptop? Absolutely not. So you have to pick and choose how your life works and how you want to use uh, your devices. And by just dedicating devices to certain activities, when you pick up that device, there's actually something that happens in your brain that kind of gets you into that mode. When I sit at my desk with my computer, I'm going into writing mode. When I crawl into bed with my laptop, I know I'm going to watch the latest episode of Outlander. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it is. Right. Um, there is, of course, an exception to the rule, which is travel. Um, on this particular trip, I'm visiting beautiful Victoria right now. I am traveling with all my devices, which is unusual. When I go on a bigger trip, I try and consolidate and just pick and choose. What work am I actually going to do while I'm on the road? What entertainment do I need to amuse me on a long-haul flight or those sorts of decisions? And by doing that, I lighten the load. I'm a big fan of traveling light. I think that is partly what Declutter Your Data is about, is just lightening the amount of stuff, the amount of digital stuff that we have. You can do force discipline, too. So, for example, we talked about, I mean, I'm traveling this weekend coming up to New York City. I'm bringing only my iPad Pro with me, which can do a hell of a lot of the stuff mm -hmm. I need to do. So the next computer purchase I do, so let's let's uh, what I'm going to do there is... I'm going to buy an iMac, and there's a reason behind that. Number one, it's very it's a it's a powerful machine, but there's another more um, disciplined reason: is I can only do audio recording and video stuff on my iMac better than on on my iPad Pro. So it pushes me in the direction of I'm going to be traveling. I better get all that stuff done because I can't take the iMac with me. Whereas if you've got a lap, and that, that's my intention. Whereas you might have a laptop and no tablet because the tablet, the, the laptop can go with you wherever you want. Uh, same thing with, with a smartphone. You might have a tiny smartphone because you've got a tablet, so you don't need the bigger smartphone. Or maybe you get the iPhone Plus because it's bigger screen. So, again, there's, there's that deliberate. And I love the device-specific stuff. I talk about that a little bit, too. Is like just because a device can do everything doesn't mean it has to. And concurrent with that, just because an app can do everything doesn't mean it has to. Mm -hmm. I work really hard. I use all the apps. I use Facebook. I use Messenger. I use WhatsApp. I use Slack. I use all sorts of things. But I use each of them with a dedicated purpose. WhatsApp is only on my mobile phone for two reasons. One, I have a group of mom friends, and we are a support system for one another. And we keep in touch in that group for child care crises, family emergencies, mm -hmm. moral support, requests for sending wine or cookies, depending on the day. The other reason I use WhatsApp is a communications tool amongst myself, my husband, and his siblings uh, to support his older parents. Uh, they are doing well, but they do need a little extra support from time to time, and we were finding it hard to communicate. And the reason we do it in WhatsApp is that some of us are Google users and some of us are Apple users. Mm -hmm. And WhatsApp is one of the few very convenient texting apps that we found that allows group chat across platforms. Right. Uh, so multiply that by five or six communication apps, and it slowly becomes clear how you're going to dedicate each of those apps. And again, as I was saying with the devices, when you open a particular app, when you sit down with a particular device, your brain goes into that mode. When I open WhatsApp, it's more personal and social. When I open Slack, it's more professional, and it's about communication and getting work done. So as we get closer to wrapping up this episode, which, by the way, we're going to have a bonus episode, too. So people that are going to be uh, that are members are going to get some additional content. And it's going to be a longer than usual bonus episode. I'll be right up front with you on that. So if you are a member, hang on, because there's some deeper diving happening. But you mentioned communication. And one of the biggest things with uh, data clutter is email. It's massive. And it's 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 it, things live there. People live in there. Um, you mentioned one of the things, and, and I'll, I'll piggyback on top of that, is uh, the intentional use of Slack for my team and Asana, to a certain extent, allows me to know that all internal communication happens in those areas. So if I'm getting an email um, from someone on my team, it's because it's a forward in a lot of ways. Like it's a forward from someone outside of the team. So I, I'm very... I'm very understanding of what each of those what each of those tools represents, so I can be very intentional with it. Um, 
And, and same thing with uh, having separate, like you have separate calendars. I'm sure you have separate email accounts too. So <laughs> you can answer in different tone and different voice. But I want to talk about like that chasing of, most people think about, oh, if I declutter, that means getting to inbox zero. If I get that to inbox zero, then, then the clutter is gone. No. Yeah, good. Okay. No. <laughs> Take that and run with it. <laughs> Let me go, Mike. <laughs> Uh, I do not believe inbox zero is a productive use of any of our time. I do think that minimizing the amount of email in your inbox is useful. And I have a number of strategies that I use. I'm sure they echo some that Mike uses. Uh, and part of what I want to do is encourage people to really think about the, the email that's coming in and also the email that they're sending. Um, I, there's, that's probably the biggest chapter in the book is about reducing email clutter. Mm. Um, among the things I talk about is the idea of dealing with email only when you have time to open email. Uh, there's no point in peeking at your email on your mobile phone if you're not going to have time to, to respond. Um, it can be useful, you know, if you're suffering from a spam attack or something, by all means, log in and delete the spam. Like th Those things happen, but hopefully your filters are catching that kind of stuff. But stuff happens. The spammers are smart, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um but when you sit down to deal with your email, take this approach. First, go through and delete anything that you don't need. Could be a special offer from a retailer that you really love, but you don't need anything from them right now. Could be a spam message that kind of fits. Um, I'm getting quite a few of these emails from companies offering my company services. Mm -hmm. They've obviously you know, been to my website or one of my older websites. This is actually a really good uh, tip, if you get something addressed to dear CEO of old company name, mm -hmm. just delete right there because mm -hmm. they haven't done their homework. Once you've deleted all the bits and pieces you don't need, the next phase is to go through and look for your VIPs. I actually have a, a filtering system where the VIPs all go into a special inbox. If I'm short on time, I always read my VIP emails. Uh, that's close colleagues. That's people from my publishing house, family members, um, clients, of course, uh, you know, anyone like that. Deal with those emails in the moment. Read them and then do one of three things. Either you're responding right away and you're archiving the record of the conversation. You're reading it and, and deleting it because you've absorbed what you need to know and you're done. Or if it requires a longer answer, flag it as something that needs a longer answer. Mike, I know you do lots with theme days and I'm sure your listeners are familiar with that. Let's say it's related to a, a writing project. Mm -hmm. And let's say Friday is writing theme day. Well, if it's a writing-related email... Just put it aside until the Friday. Mm -hmm. It's very efficient. Um, I've got lots more stuff. I could talk for a really long time, so I'm trying to bite my tongue. No, no, I think no, no, that's no. a really practical first step. It for... is. And, and I think the thing is, remember, and some people freak about delete emails. That doesn't always mean delete. Sometimes it means archive, like just getting it into your archive. Because I mean, a lot of people go, well, I can't delete an email. Look, the archive folder is massive and often invisible. If you're like, there's certain things, again, if you know what that's that's for. That's different. But I think that a lot of people like, again, the pursuit of inbox zero is 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 a is a fruitless one because you can't control the inflow of email. And I think the other thing that I touched on, and I'm, I'm sure you touch on it, too, is the idea of if you're at work, check work email. If you're at home, check home email. Right. Like yeah. first separate the personal and professional because tone, overwhelm, all that stuff is is related to that. Um, Angela, we're going to dive more into stuff in the bonus episodes as well, but I want to, uh, you know, I want to thank you for taking the time to be here today. This is a big topic and obviously we could, we could go on for, for a long time. There is, um, again, I, I, I want people to pick up this book because, thank you. uh, there is, it's actionable. Um, there's a lot in here that I mean, we don't even touch, we can't, we, we can't possibly cover everything. I mean, there's digital parenting stuff here. There's physical fitness there's the idea of fighting fake news which we're going to touch on a little bit in the in the bonus episode there's the idea of you know like managing estate stuff and legacy protection and things like that but where can people get this book or pre-order this book uh order the book whenever you're listening to this when they need this book where they where can they get it well their first stop should just be angela crocker.com slash dyd to okay. cut your data there's a page there a little bit more about the book um, but pick your retailer of choice. It's available for pre-sale right now on uh, Amazon Canada, Amazon.com, Amazon U uh, UK, all around the world. Uh, the major book retailers, chapters in Canada, 
Barnes and Nobles in the, in the U.S., uh, Australia, New Zealand, literally. I've even got readers in the Philippines. Um, anywhere that your favorite bookstore is. And by all means, contact your local book retailer. I'm a big fan of independent bookstores. And every city I go to, I go and visit them. I'm here in Victoria, and I popped by Monroe's yesterday. Uh, they all have access to order it as well. Uh, my publisher is Self Counsel International, and uh, they really do bring the international. So wherever you like to go, thank you very much for picking it up. And uh, Where else can people follow you intentionally? They can follow me <laughs> intentionally if they like. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. There's actually a Facebook page specific to the book called okay. Declutter Your Data by Angela Crocker. You can also find me on Twitter and on Instagram, simply at Angela Crocker. Awesome. Thanks for joining me today, Angela. My pleasure. Thanks, Mike. Big thanks to Angela for joining me back then, and I hope to have her on the show again really, really soon. If you want to check out all of the relevant links and everything we discussed during this episode, just look at the podcast app you're using right now, or go to productivityist.com slash podcast 507 to get all of those goodies. And one of the ways that you can help the show support the show, and this is a good time of year to kick up your productiveness, is to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Leaving a rating or review is also super helpful as it will help me make the show better. And another way to support the show, of course, is to check out the sponsors that you heard during our conversation today. You can check out our sponsors at productivityist.com slash podcast sponsors. Check them out through that platform. That way they know that we sent you. That's it. This is the final episode of 2023. And uh, I'm looking forward to what's next in the months ahead. We've got episodes lined up for months and there's a plethora of productive conversations. I hope you'll join me for those. Until next time, I'm Mike Varda, the host of A Productive Conversation, reminding you to stop doing productive and start being productive and have a happy start to 2024. I'll see you later.